The Radio Forest Podcast. Eric Bloom. That's me. Are you guys going to bring any motorcycles? I know back in the day you'd have motorcycles on stage, and I've seen you in Harley gear before. Do you still ride? Um, Not currently because my wife would kill me. That's not happening. You're an old man. Don't do that anymore. What started your love with motorcycles? Did you have an uncle or somebody oh, or a I, friend? I, I, I've been riding my whole life. Ever since I had a sort of a crash, I'm done with that for, for the time being. Was it pretty serious? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I certainly hurt myself. But, you know, anybody who rides a bike will tell you, you know, they've uh, crashed at least once. Going back to when we had a band house on Long Island, we didn't even have a telephone because we couldn't afford it. And uh, that's how we're, how early and how far back we go. I was on my way to go use a payphone. It also shows you how far back we go before cell phones. And um, some lady pulled out of her driveway and I hit her broadside. Oh, man. Riding my motorcycle. That was my uh, Suzuki 500 two-stroke uh, Titan. So I've been riding a long time. Yeah, I sold uh, my road bikes, and I just have a dirt bike kind of because of that. I had kids, and then I didn't ride anything for like two years. I was just cautious, you know, stories like that that you can't really avoid, and it's not your fault. So I've just been riding in the woods in the meantime, and I just kind of lost the love of the road. For now, I don't know what changed, but I definitely can sympathize with you about, you know, the motorcycles. Well, I'm, 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 a, I'm a car guy. I've always been... Uh into uh, motors and engines and stuff like that, bikes, cars, whatever. You got any cool cars now? Um, you know, I got a couple. Nothing, nothing super special, like no Ferraris or anything, uh, anything like that. I was hoping more for a muscle car, maybe like a Chevelle or something like that. I, I've had stuff like that. I had a 65 Malibu SS convertible. I have a Cadillac XLR. I like that. A 2004. You guys got the newest album out now, The Symbol Remains. And I've talked to, I think, both Bouchard brothers in the last two or three years, and, and you once too, but a couple of things I didn't get to, I had heard that maybe Message in a Bottle by the police is sort of borrowed from that opening riff from Blue Oyster Colts, Don't Fear the Reaper. Well, uh, interesting you mentioned that because we were in a rehearsal studio, oh, it's got to be 20, 25 years ago. I went out to get a beverage from the, uh, our rehearsal and lo and behold, there's Sting sitting there because he was rehearsing in the same place. So I introduced myself, and we had a nice little chat, and he admitted the same. <laughs> I heard it from Sting. He says, you know, I stole that lick from Don't Fear the Reaper for Message in a Bottle. And I said, well, you're under arrest. <laughs> so uh, it was a very pleasant conversation. As a matter of fact, if you play those side by side, you can certainly hear it. And uh, he was very pleasant. He gave me a couple of tickets, too. He was playing... Back when he was playing sort of a, a jazz era, because he does change change up what he does from time to time. And uh, he's a very nice guy. And now that song ended up in Halloween. You guys are sci-fi fans, or at least I know that you are. Does that sort of encompass horror, or is that kind of cool at the time? Or talk me through a little bit of that song ending up in Halloween. That's another interesting um, anecdote. Because um, Sony, uh, the label we, we are on, or we used to be on, which w used to be Columbia Records, they sold the, the movie people, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, without telling us. A friend of the band said, you know, Don't Fear the Reaper is in the movie Halloween. We didn't even know it. Oh, no way. Yeah, it's a true story. So uh, we had to go back in and renegotiate that deal because um, we didn't even know about it. Wow. Now... Is it true that you also didn't know that that was going to be used on SNL until you saw it live? That was like another thing. You're like, wait, what? Blueish or cold? That's yeah, us. Yeah, no, we didn't even know about that either. Yeah, the uh, the cowbell sketch. Yeah, we didn't know anything about that. That's so crazy. You assume bands are like in these meetings and negotiations and SNL gives you a call and goes, hey, we want to do this. What do you think about that? What are the names no, of the bands? Just, but nothing. Uh, you know, you could you could go in and watch that over and over, which I have. And a uh, matter of fact, I saw it live the night it happened. Of course, you know, it threw me for a loop. I said, what? You know, they're doing us? Wow. There are some mistakes in the factual content of, of that gag, you know, of the story. The guy called Buck and they call him Eric. 
Will Ferrell is obviously playing the guy that sort of looks like me back in those days, <laughs> you know, except, uh, you know, I, I don't have my belly sticking over my belt quite like that. <laughs> a little bit these days, but not back in those days. Yeah. It was kind of funny. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's it certainly listed now as, if not number one, but certainly one of the top 10 sketches of all time. Top 10 for sure maybe even the top three. It's just so iconic. It certainly is. And for a while, uh, you know, t-shirts they sell on Times Square, like, you know, more cowbell is one of the top two or three t-shirts they sell on Times Square. If you tell a classic rock fan, I got a fever, they already know that's a reference to Blue Oyster Cult. I met a guy, I was just up at Q104.3 doing a little promotion, which is uh, one of the top classic rock stations uh, in New York. And with Ken Dashow, who, who is a uh, it's a streaming station also. We're doing a little radio promotion. He introduces me to a guy who's a young guy, probably a, you know, a 30-something guy. Ken says, oh, this is you know that gag, that, that cowbell gag. Eric is in that band. No. He says, oh, that's a real band? That's a real <laughs> band? But that can work in your benefit because they're kind of making fun of the situation and the characters. Will Ferrell has the belly, so they use the belly. So fans might hear that and go, I actually like that song a lot. Oh, that's a real... Oh, these guys have... 20 different albums. This is amazing. So rather than poking fun at you, that might bring some people to the band. Well, I think it, I think it worked out that way. It certainly uh, was, didn't hurt us at all. It was um, you know, kind of a boost. And it was a fun thing because I certainly didn't take that as, as anything disparaging to us. It was a lot of fun. I heard that you had ran into two different people throughout your career, and possibly these guys several times. But Axl Rose came to see you guys in L.A. and also... You went and saw Ronnie James Dio play at a college party that you also were playing. Yeah, well, Ronnie and I were, were I can't say we were great friends, but we certainly knew each other. And we came from the same geographical area in upstate New York. We both made our bones up there. Ronnie was from Cortland, New York. Now, of course, your listeners are, are from the Boise area. But Cortland, New York is um, the upstate New York bar band scene was very insulated and a lot of great bands came out of that area and also i'm talking about 50 years ago there was a handful of bands that really started from that area ronnie was two or three years older than me when i got to college in upstate new york around 1965 i started my first band and ronnie was already established as a local guy there so I saw Ronnie in every one of his incarnations. He was in a band when I got to school called Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. And I used to go see him play at fraternity parties. So he was playing like in the living room of a big house. <laughs> so I got to see him play like at a, at a fraternity party, like Animal House. There he was. Actually, he was playing trumpet and bass. He was the lead singer and the bass player and the horn player like in somebody's living room. And I was a huge fan of his before he ever became really famous. He was a great guy. That's amazing. So you got to see him become the Ronnie James Dio that we know. Ronnie, you know, went from Ronnie Dio and the Prophets to when the psychedelic era happened, they became the Electric Elves. Then that became Elf. And then Elf was opening for Deep Purple. When Richie Blackmore left Deep Purple, he became friendly with the guys in Elf, and he turned that into Rainbow. And that's the genesis of Ronnie's climb to fame, because Ronnie Dio became the lead vocalist of Rainbow. What's a quick story with Axel coming to see you guys? Not to get to SNL again, but basically we're not worthy to you. Yeah, it was kind of, kind of interesting. We were playing um, a theater in uh, L.A. at the uh, Wiltern Theater, and uh, he just, just walked into the dressing room, and um, said, hey, how you guys doing? Whoa, Axl Rose, you know, and this was in right as his first album came out. You know, we were kind of blown away. He came in to say hi. So that was very neat. Very short story, though. Last question. I know you saw Metallica on the Master of Puppets tour. What was it like then for the garage days when Metallica decided to cover Blue Oyster Cult? Well, uh, they, I guess, you know, when, when they were in high school, they were BOC fans. They've covered us several times both astronomy and veteran of the psychic wars and they were fans of ours did you like that released version of astronomy uh, yeah sure but uh, it was i thought the way they turned around uh, veterans was kind of cool too eric bloom from blue oyster cult the newest album out now called the symbol remains 
Eric, pleasure talking to you. Great talking to you, and bye-bye.